All right, y'all, welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I am the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and I've recorded more than 5,000 interviews going back to 2003, all of which are available at scotthorton.org. You can also sign up for the podcast feed. The full archive is also available at youtube.com slash Show. All right, you guys, introducing Jessica Katzenstein from Brown University's Cost of War Project. And uh, she is the author of this important new study, The Wars Are Here, How the United States Post-9-11 Wars Helped Militarize U.S. Police. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? Uh, Thanks so much. Uh, Great. It's a pleasure to be here. Cool. Well, I read the whole thing, and it's really important, and I hope people will take uh, a very good look at it. Um, as Randolph Bourne said back a hundred years ago, uh, a little bit more than that, uh, war is the health of the state and that's bad. <laughs> and so <laughs> this is what we have, uh, a, a more uh, contemporary, um, but also important, uh, quote along these lines was, uh, the great Chalmers Johnson, author of Nemesis, the last days of the American Republic. And he said, you give up your empire or you live under it. And he made comparisons to other world empires who had had the choice of whether they would go ahead and abandon their empire and try to uh, shore up what was left of uh, their home country, uh, such as the British did after World War II, basically cutting it loose, uh, versus other empires who hung on till the bitter end and uh, destroyed themselves, enslaved themselves on the way to total destruction. And so those are our choices, and looks like we're going to go ahead and keep our empire and live under it too, huh? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, now, so um, there's a lot of backstory in here about the history of policing and and the rise of militarization, but I guess it makes sense to at least start in the 90s. You can't cover all of it, but uh, the drug war really cranked up in the 1990s. And uh, that really set the prelude for, well, in the 80s, too. But I think the militarization, the rise of the constant SWAT raids, rather than just holding them for supposed hostage situations and that kind of thing, that all really broke through in the 1990s before George W. Bush ever even showed up to make it that much worse, right? Yeah, absolutely. So the 1033 program, which is what... um Uh, I think a lot of folks who know something about police militarization are the most familiar with um, that was formalized uh, in 1990, 1991, the fiscal year. Um, And of course, as as you're saying, we also saw um, a rise in in SWAT raids and no-knock raids. Um, Radley Balco has a really great history of this uh, in his book. Um, and, and yeah, I think um, that's part of what my report tries to point to um, the, the deep roots um, the deep roots of this of this militarization that we're seeing today in these protests that we saw in the raid um, on uh, Breonna Taylor's home. Um, so much of that is connected to um, connected to the war on drugs. Mm-hmm. And then, as you say in here, so much of the war on drugs and militarization overall is caught up in issues of race and class, which you know oftentimes uh, you know overlap with each other and that kind of thing. And uh, I noticed you had even mentioned the uh, attack, the FBI supported uh, bombing of MOVE by the Philadelphia police. And I always forget if it was 84 or 86. Uh, do you remember? Uh, yeah, bomb. I also always, I'm uh, really bad with It's it. okay. I always forget the year. But yeah, no, it was a horrible thing. Uh, civilians killed and all that. But I was actually surprised at your omission of uh, the Waco massacre in here. Uh, because it was such a major watershed in terms of the militarization of the police and including even had, you know, the FBI's special operations team, the hostage rescue team, in alliance with the actual Army Delta Force, uh, waging the final battle against the Branch Davidians uh, there. And I don't know if you know this, and I guess a lot of people don't, but there were dozens of blacks who were members of the Branch Davidians. And they were portrayed as these right-wing Trans Am driving rednecks and all this kind of thing. But there were, you know, at least a dozen or two dozen blacks who lived there. And that was actually one of the motivations of the ATF to raid them was because it was the ATF who were the white supremacists and they were mad at David Koresh for his alleged miscegenation with these women. 
uh, who were there. And that was a big part of what got them raided in the first place was what rednecks they weren't on that issue. And then that was, I know for a fact from back then, and that was the watershed. That was when the gates of every military base in America basically flung open wide for every sheriff's department and police agency to come in and get trained by soldiers. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And you're right. That is a, that is an omission in the report. And just to say the, the move bombing I just checked is uh, 1985. So 85. Right oh, see, I was wrong on both <laughs> counts. It's right in the middle. Yeah. Right, right, but right. yeah, no, no Waco is a big one. And, you know, I think because it was right at the beginning of Bill Clinton era and the end of Reagan and Bush and the whole kind of liberal mood was so caught up with the the uh, first hundred days of Bill Clinton right then. And they just didn't want to even think about the other side of the issue in this case. So there were very few leftists like uh, Alexander Coburn and Bill Hicks and just a couple of others who really you know, stuck their neck out and said, I don't care, you know, exactly who these victims are, but the way in which they are victims is absolutely intolerable. What's going on, you know, what the government has done to them. And so it was kind of a weird partisan thing where it just never became really an issue among human rights groups and, and that kind of deal. And then instead it became a cause of the right, which helps kind of reinforce that issues for you and this issues for me or, you know, these kinds of things. But the real issue is that what G. Gordon Liddy called them the jackbooted thugs back when they were attacking the Branch Davidians and to seize their guns is essentially, yeah, exactly the same jackbooted thugs in every sheriff's department and every police department in this land and the way that they treat people as though the Bill of Rights was never written. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, you're clearly more familiar with that part of, uh, of the history than I am. I'll send um, you some great propaganda. But anyway, <laughs> thanks, but, it, I'm looking forward to it. but yeah, and anyway, I'm sorry, I just, it's really important. I like to highlight that, but I don't mean to take away from, from your great work in here because there's um, so much of it and it's really mind blowing stuff and the kind of statistics that I think at first glance, people shouldn't believe because it sounds just so out of proportion, but then they should let that disbelief turn to shock when they read that, no, it's not 50, it's 60,000 SWAT raids a year in this country. And then as you did the long division, I'll trust you, 165 per day, every right. day. Well, and all of these are just estimates. And in a lot of states, um, SWAT teams are not required to keep records. In the state where I did my own field work in Maryland, um, there's actually fairly decent record keeping. But Nationally, these are these are just estimates, and the way that it has been normalized um, is is part of the story that I'm trying to trace. And you know, there's so much more here that 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 we could talk about that couldn't fit into the history section. Uh, what you're talking about with with Waco and um, all of these other '90s, early 2000s um, events, just being one piece of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and that's almost all over drug prohibition, right? These are not people who are wanted on murder warrants. Uh, or do you have those stats? This is just contraband, uh, mostly, right? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, the ACLU did a report on this um, that uh, is widely cited, uh, War Comes Home, in 2014. And they were necessarily limited by the data that are available, but... Um, they found that 79% of SWAT deployments uh, in the sample they had were for warrants, and most of those were for drug investigations. And of course, they found that the vast majority of, of people subject to those investigations and, and to SWAT raids uh, were people of color, specifically Black and Latinx people. Mm-hmm. And this is the same terror that the people of Afghanistan are subjected to when they send in the Navy SEALs or the Delta Force uh, to do their what they're called night raids when it's the foreign war. And it's just like this. And in, in, in most cases, the object is to capture, not kill. But boy, do they sure kill a lot, just like in these. And essentially, it's the same standard. Yep, yep, exactly. And it's it's fascinating when you delve into the logics for, uh, for how SWAT raids are done, uh, the police logics for it. Um, and the idea that I was often told by police um, was that uh, bursting in, um, and 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 jumping in a house, raiding a house before anyone has time to react is actually safer for everyone because uh, people don't have time to grab their guns or to flush their drugs or whatever. But then, of course, we see uh, in in our wars um, and also uh, at home. And again, this is the connection I'm I'm pointing to here um, that 
you know, people like Breonna Taylor, people like Ayanna Stanley Jones um, are are victimized by um, the the kind of um, the kind of violence that these SWAT raids license. Mm. Oh, and they're such liars. I mean, would they even pretend that there's a study somewhere that pointed to all the times that whenever they would hide behind their cars with a megaphone and say, "Come out with your hands up," that they were always just treated with ambush and massacred? And that's what drove them to have to do it this way, because that's not the history of what happened here at all. And you know what? That is part of the lie about Waco that, again, hey, it was a SWAT raid in the first place. But never mind begging that question. The lie was they were greeted with an ambush. So it it would have made no sense for them to just go and knock on the door when, in fact, they weren't. The people, you know, the cops shot first and the people only shot back to defend themselves. But that was part of the narrative. And in fact, in the Waco hearings, one of the leaders of ATF says the days of a couple of detectives walking up to a door and knocking on the door to serve a warrant of any kind is over because that's where we stand between the David Koresh's of the world and all the legislators here, you know, as though David Koresh was going around attacking other people. Um, (laughs) But anyway, um, so. Uh, but that would have been the standard, you know, like on TV when I was a kid, come out with your hands up. We got you surrounded. There's nowhere to go. And I, I noticed there, and I know it wasn't you, it was them conflating the danger of them having the time to pull out a gun to target the cops with the danger that they might flush a little bit of contraband down the toilet, which is dangerous right. to exactly nobody except a prosecutor trying to make a case for an offense. Exactly. And that's where we get back to the drug war. And actually, one thing I was told in my research with the SWAT teams is that uh, SWAT team, the SWAT team members, of course, um, argued that uh, they were safer people to do drug raids because narcotics teams, which also uh, can conduct these kinds of raids in some places, um, will be much more concerned with getting inside and getting the drugs. Uh, whereas they would argue that SWAT teams are more professional because they're more sort of objective and disconnected from that overarching goal of getting the drugs. And of course, there's a lot to, to question and discuss there. Um, but it kind of shows the, the complexity um, of these issues. Uh, and then, of course, as, as you're saying, one gets into the post facto justifications for botched raids, um, as again, we just saw in the Breonna Taylor case. Right. Yeah, and, and actually, I want to give you a minute to talk a little bit more about that case, uh, if you'd like to, because, you know, I think people probably know some about it, but maybe they don't know uh, really what happened there. But I wanted to point out that, you know, I know that there are some really tough cities in this country with very high crime rates and that kind of thing. But there are also a lot of cities and towns that aren't like that at all. Austin, Texas, for example, has an almost non-existent crime rate and including in the poorest uh, neighborhoods on the east side of town in the southeast and wherever and off of Rumberg and the northwest. The, The worst crime rates are not very high. And so to have cops in just about any situation dressed up as soldiers and driving around in armored personnel carriers and all these things it's almost like it's live action role play you know larping they call it where it's, <laughs> they're pretending to be at war except there are no enemies anywhere you're talking about what's poor people with no shoes standing around selling nickel bags or something or some kind of thing has got to stand in for the insurgent menace that they're fighting against But they don't have anybody to fight. There's nobody to fight. And whatever gun violence takes place is almost always a crimes of passion rather than important organized crime or systematic robberies and muggings in certain parts of town, something like that. So it's the kind of stuff that you can't prevent anyway. And and just but they don't. I think when this started, I remember in the late 90s when these guys started really dressing up like soldiers all the time and driving around their armor personnel carriers that. They knew and we knew and they knew we knew and it was all kind of absurd that is it's kind of funny and they felt a little funny dressing up that way. But then that kind of went away and now they've sort of normalized that idea. And then, like you say, with the post hoc, they have to rationalize that. Well, you know, the people of Austin really are that bad or else how come we're so militarized against them? If it wasn't for <laughs> us, this city would tear itself apart, you know, whatever it is that they imagine. Or else, how come they're not wearing a blouse and carrying a thirty-eight? <laughs> right. No, it's it's an incredibly seductive, um, incredibly seductive logic, I think, and, and an incredibly seductive sense of power. 
um, when you know you're you're driving around in those armored vehicles and and carrying heavy weapons. Um, and uh, it's often justified um, by pointing to the uncertainty, the possibility of what could happen. And what could happen is that there could be a mass shooter and we could need this equipment uh, to deal with them. And of course, we have seen mass shootings happen in places that no one would expect. Um, but at the same time, as I point out in the report, um, the 1033 program, for instance, requires you to use all of the equipment that you get through the program within one year or you have to return it to the Department of Defense. So even if you justify obtaining this equipment, um, uh, this, this surplus military equipment, um, you know, by pointing to the, the possibility of terrorism, quote unquote, or of a mass shooting, um, if that doesn't happen within your jurisdiction within a year, which is plausible, um, then, you know, then you have to find some other way to use it. Right. And boy, isn't that funny uh, the way that that kind of incentive system can be set up and nobody questions it that I mean, because it makes sense on the face of it that, hey, if you guys don't need this stuff, you got to give it back. But come on, the flip side of that obviously is you better come up with a use for it, which means what are we talking about? Military equipment at the ex being used at the expense of the civilian population of the town you're supposedly protecting. Right. Right. And this outrage, you know, that, that, that we all justly feel, um, I think it's important to situate that. I mean, many of us, and, and I'm talking particularly about middle upper class folks, white folks, um, uh, you know, only see this equipment on TV um, when it comes to protests, when it comes to major protests, they're getting a lot of media coverage, like, um, like the George Floyd protests. Um, but we're not seeing how they're being used um, in, in these SWAT raids every day. And again, you cited that figure that I um, had in my paper about 165 times per day, which is almost certainly a, an underestimate. Um, so it's also important to see exactly as you're saying how much uh, how much the use of this equipment and just as importantly, militarized tactics um, has been normalized and accepted. Yeah. Hey, I'll check it out. The Libertarian Institute, that's me and my friends, have published three great books this year. First is No Quarter, The Ravings of William Norman Grigg. He was the best one of us. Now he's gone, but this great collection is a truly fitting legacy for his fight for freedom. I know you'll love it. Then there's Coming to Palestine by the great Sheldon Richmond. It's a collection of 40 important essays he's written over the years about the truth behind the Israel-Palestine conflict. You'll learn so much and highly value this definitive libertarian take on the dispossession of the Palestinians and the reality of their brutal occupation. And last but not least is the great Ron Paul, the Scott Horton Show interviews 2004 through 2019, interview transcripts of all of my interviews of the good doctor over the years on all the wars, money, taxes, the police state, and more. So how do you like that? Pretty good, right? Find them all at libertarianinstitute.org slash books. Hey guys, here's how to support this show. You can donate in various amounts at scotthorton.org slash donate. We've got some great kickbacks for you there. Shop amazon.com by way of my link at scotthorton.org. Leave a good review for the show at iTunes and Stitcher. Tell a friend, I don't know. Oh yeah, and buy my books, Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and The Great Ron Paul, The Scott Horton Show Interviews 2004 through 2019. And thanks. Hey guys, check out Listen and Think audiobooks. They're listenandthink.com and of course on audible.com. And they feature my book, Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, as well as brand new Out Inside Syria by our friend Reese Ehrlich and a lot of other great books, mostly by libertarians there. Uh, Reese might be one exception, but essentially they're all uh, libertarian audiobooks. And here's how you can get a lifetime subscription to Listen and Think audiobooks. Just donate $100 to The Scott Horton Show at scotthorton.org slash donate. Well, and so back to Breonna Taylor here and how this is so much at the root of racial problems in this country right now because it makes sense that overall, you know, supposedly the, you know, quote unquote, the black minority community in America, that they would feel like the white majority doesn't care about them and doesn't care about their rights, that we let this go on mostly at their expense, certainly relatively speaking. 
um, in terms of numbers at their expense. But they would be wrong to presume that most white Americans of that majority have any power whatsoever. And that this is our decision and our policy that we've decided to deliberately inflict it all on them whatsoever. There's nothing we can do about it. It's the cops of all races. It's the government, the state itself, that is their enemy. And yet they're right to recognize that they don't control it, but they're just wrong to assume that the power does devolve broadly speaking and and maybe i'm i'm wrong to presume how many of them presume that but it just seems like that's the frame of the argument is that racism itself is the problem when it's the state itself having the power to enforce racial prejudice that makes it racism really in the first place that's what makes it a system is these people showing up to work every day and putting on their costume jewelry and going out with their guns to enforce all these edicts against people. And, of course, against the people who have the least juice to fight back with within the system. Yeah. I mean, I might push back a, a okay. little bit and say um, and say that I, I think, you know, racism and state power and, and white supremacy are all inseparable. And, yes, um, you know, ordinary non-cops are not the ones doing these raids, but... Um, we know from systemic historical analyses of policing that policing as an institution protects, of course, state power, is state power, but also enforces white supremacy and, and, and um, uh, elite dominance um, at the expense of um, black folks, brown, indigenous, poor people. Um, well, so, white supremacy, how broadly defined? Ah. Uh, Great question. Uh, I, I, think I mean, like, like it used to be in Texas that they had an all white primary because, hey, it's a private organization. No blacks allowed. And then but it's a one party state. And so you don't get to participate. Now, that's white supremacy. But that's been illegal since the 60s. And um, so, I, you know, some of these things I'll, I'll give you I'll give you the counterexample coming from the other way. George W. Bush wrote an essay saying after George Floyd, saying, when a when will white Americans erase the blemish of racial hatred from their heart? When he, literally, that individual man, is the son of a bitch who gave a tank <laughs> to 18,000 county and city police organizations around this country and told them, but you better use it or else you have to give it back. But he wants to say it's every everybody who just shows up at church Sunday morning and never did anything to anybody. It's their fault for presumably having some, you know, wrong emotion uh, rather than. No, it's him and the people who worked for him and carried out his orders and did the things he told them to do that led us directly to the crisis that we're in right now. Him and, you know, all of the people like him, Joe Biden financing the whole thing all along, of course, from the Senate. Right. Right. No, that piousness and the uh, the post facto rehabilitation of George W. Bush is a a whole conversation. Um, but I'm I mean I'm talking about white supremacy, not not only in the sense, or not primarily in the sense of ideological white supremacy um, in terms of ideological beliefs, but in the broader sense in which uh, you know critical race theorists and and many others talk about white supremacy as a as a system. Um, that keeps um, black folks and brown and indigenous folks in particular um, uh, in a subordinate position from which wealth can be um, extracted. Yeah. Although, um, except they really treat poor white people the exact same way, don't they? Well, I point to poverty also and, and class as, of course, an important axis here. Um, what we, of course, there's no uh, race and class are inseparable in many senses, but um, that's not to say that class is not also an access of victimization. And we see that um, when one looks at the statistics of um, white folks who are killed by, by police also, as, as far as I can remember, um, and, and as would make sense, um, yeah. the vast majority of those folks are, are not middle class or wealthy. Right. Yeah, I think what, it's all, what it really comes down to is juice, right? That's what they call it. You ever see that show, The Wire, where this is the oh, yeah. currency inside government agencies right it's not money it's well it is money too but it's juice and who's got juice with who and how much and so if cops pick on a guy like me they know that there's some greater chance on the margin that my uncle's a judge or something and then they might have to uh 
get yelled at by the boss or some kind of inconvenience to them. Whereas if I'm a poor black guy, they know that they can get away with splitting my skull open. And the chances that my uncle's a judge are, eh, eh, they're somewhere on this scale, but they're pretty slim. And so it's easier to go. That's what makes it systemic, but that's what makes it sort of not really even about race anymore at that point. You know, it's, I mean, it's clearly tied up in race, but to make it about white supremacy and, and black victimization only, I think, obscures more than it clarifies a lot of the times, you know? I mean, I think that I would certainly argue that um, it that that the question of policing in the U.S. and and militarization specifically, as I argue, is is absolutely inseparable from uh, from anti-blackness and the the long trajectory of anti-blackness in this in this country. But that's nowhere to say that that's the only um, the only axis of concern. And that's also where I point to the colonial history um, of, of U.S. policing and its inheritances. Um, and again, no one is saying that police, police violence is confined to, um, confined only to certain communities. Uh, I don't think anybody is, is making that argument. Right. Um, but the point is to look at the disproportionate, uh, on whom most of the violence falls, right. uh, on whom most of the exploitation and oppression falls. And, and that's very clear. Yeah, no, country. I totally agree with you. And it is very important, as you say, that like, look, to a lot of people, this stuff only happens on TV. And you might kind of think that it only happens on TV. It's not really happening in real life at all. But then you get a statistic like 60,000 of these things a year. And then you count there's only 52 weeks and then 50 because of thanksgiving and christmas you know so <laughs> what how in the world could that even possibly be right and what in the world is the government up to doing this and you know also i wanted to point out uh, speaking of of how tied up this is in uh, the persecution of racial minorities and and uh, this is one of the huge ones is you talk about the influence of the marine corps on um the lapd in the 1980s there with uh chief gates and I'm not sure if this is the same footnote that you had or not, but we had talked about this on the show back years ago about how the Marines actually had learned counterinsurgency from the LAPD. And the LAPD mm-hmm. had originally gone to, I guess, the British or, you know, whatever stupid Malaysia model, uh, whatever it is, kind of counterinsurgency theory. And then the Marines came and learned it from them for use in Vietnam. And then by the 80s, the LAPD had forgotten it, and so they went back to the Marines to then relearn counterinsurgency from them. And then this was what they used for what's you know known as the drug wars in South Central LA in the 1980s, where you see just just like you know Petraeus and them in Iraq doing sweeps of fighting age males. Basically, anybody south of the 10 is fair game between the ages of. 12 and 30 or whatever it is and just grab them all and charge them with as much as you can lock them all down and all this stuff and um that of course was all caught up that whole drug war was generated by while the the dea and the lapd and whatever state police forces and whatever were cracking down on these markets it was ronald reagan's cia that was filling those markets to the rim with cocaine and and you know, all through Freeway Ricky Ross and, and supplying the Crips and the Bloods and, you know, incre- you know creating essentially the crack epidemic. And it wasn't because, um, and Gary Webb never said either, that it was because they were trying to destroy the black community with this conspiracy to flood them with cocaine. That wasn't it. It was just that they didn't give a damn about them at all. And that was why they did it. They were perfectly comfortable doing it to them because who cares? And that was their attitude. And so not only did they have their community absolutely flooded with this massive supply of cocaine to pay for the Contra war in Nicaragua, but then they had the full clamp down of the war on drugs against them too. And the implementation of this coin where nobody even knows how many completely innocent people got caught up in that who never even saw a rock before who, but who still went to prison as part of all of that, you know, and maybe never made it out. Yeah, I mean, these, this is where these connections are, are incredibly important and, and incredibly clear, um, because, and, you know, absolutely would be a whole other paper to talk about the ways that the military has, in fact, learned from the police. Um, but this is where, again, I think it's, it's so important to kind of 
um, disentangle the American exceptionalism and American centrism that that one can find at the heart of even some progressive discourses on police militarization in the U.S. because it obscures these connections that you're talking about um, between, you know, counterinsurgency tactics and the ways that um, drug markets have been uh, instrumentalized and, and, and built up. Um, obscures these connections and make it seem like, um, you know, that 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 kind of repression and military violence that you're talking about um, throughout throughout our recent history um, are simply to be expected. Whereas what we need to challenge is what's happening here. And um, right. I and, and many others have also pointed to uh, the fact that that militarization of the police uh, at home and the violence of the U.S. military abroad are completely inextricable. Right. And now, which, by the way, um, did I read this right that you say that even though the 1033 program is more widely known that the Department of Homeland Security parallel program of militarization of uh, local police departments is even vastly greater, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, DHS's uh, Homeland Security grant program uh, is massive. It's been channeling over a billion dollars per year to lower levels of government since uh, I believe it was 2003, um, and that can be used for, it can't be used to buy weapons, um, but it can be used for equipment like helicopters, for preparedness training, um, and even to pay the kind of subsidiary costs of the 1033 program. So police receive this equipment for free, but they're required to pay to transport and store and repair it, and Homeland Security Grant Program can be used for that also under the banner of counterterror preparedness. Yeah. And then you say in here that, uh, do I have it right in my notes? Do I remember it right that this, uh, out of the 1.6 billion, oh, I guess it was two different notes here. It's 1.6 billion was for the 1033 program, but then you have another section where you talk about uh, either percents or dollar figures on how much of this stuff is quite literally Iraq War II surplus equipment that was brought home after the war. Right. I mean, as far as I know, um, there's no way to to really publicly track precisely where it comes from. So as I learned in my own research, um, some of the equipment that comes through the 1033 program dates back to, you know, the, the 60s, 70s. Um, so it's hard to tell. But what we do see when we trace um, when we trace equipment transfers um, is that major upsurges kind of begin around, I think it's about 2010 or so. Um, uh, as we see um, mine resistant vehicles, more helicopters and so on being transferred uh, in the wake of the military demobilization, um, particularly the drawdown from Iraq in, in 2010. Um, so, yeah, we have seen a ramp up that is very clearly tied to the post 9-11 wars. Yep. Well, saw that coming, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Not to say I told you so, everybody, but yeah, me and a lot of other people did too. And here we are living deep in the future now, looking back on this gigantic folly and the consequences for our own society here. And which, you know, I, the one thing about it, when it's this stark, when the bad news is this stark, then at least maybe it can provoke people to imagine what might have been had we thought a little bit more clearly about what we were doing. You know? Rather yeah, than going yeah. for this kind of stuff over and over again. Of course. And, and you know, this is only one piece of it. And I, and I know that you've covered this in, in many different contexts in your show. Cost of War Project also covers different uh, components of the, of the right. toll um, of these wars. Uh, yeah, with no peers, you do, by the way, I'd like to say. Uh, this is the very best work that the rest of us rely on, of course, at the Cost of War Project. <laughs> I'm happy to be a part of it. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, listen, I really appreciate your time on the show, Jessica. It's been great. And I really hope that people will go and uh, read this thing. It's just 20 pages. It's a nice, good study. Lots of facts, but not too long. You get through it. The wars are here. How the United States post 9-11 wars helped militarize U.S. police by Jessica Katzenstein. Thank you again. Thanks so much, Scott. It's great to talk to you. The Scott Horton Show, Anti-War Radio can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in L.A., APSradio.com, Antiwar.com, ScottHorton.org, and LibertarianInstitute.org.